It used to be a very common sight, people walking together, discussing the events of the day. These days, even if there's a lot more people home, there's a lot less discussing taking place since, you know, social distancing. But let's take a cue from our Bible story today. Let's go on a walk and discuss the story, the events of the day. Let's be, as the old camp song says, a sermon in shoes. Come along with me. Do you know, O oh Christian, you're a sermon in shoes? Do you know, O oh Christian, you're a sermon in shoes? Jesus calls upon you to spread the gospel news. So walk it and talk it, a sermon in shoes. So let's walk together on this journey as we talk about the story that we heard today as actually these two disciples were doing on that, well, that first Easter Sunday. These two disciples, I think they started in a time of excitement. I think all conversation actually starts with a point of excitement, not always positive. Excitement isn't always a positive emotion. Sometimes you can be excited about something that is decidedly negative, something like, I don't know, like the death of Jesus and uh, how it would have felt on that particular day of these disciples that are just missing their rabbi, their teacher, their, their Lord and Savior, you don't expect to die on a cross. And so they had a lot to discuss that day. In fact, I think it's good to talk things through. Something about walking and talking, it gives an opportunity to discuss things more in depth. In fact, <laughs> there were ancient teachers that used a lot of walking and talking and uh, the modern teacher, uh, Aaron Sorkin, okay, filmmaker, if you will, does a lot of walking and talking too. It takes some inspiration from him today. But this walking and talking is all started with this sense of excitement, the sense of the heart burning within you or racing quickly because of everything that's going on. And so I'm gonna to talk today about this idea of heartburn, the heartburn of excitement, the hopeful heartburn that we experience as we walk and talk. So come with me. So let's talk about Cleopas and his companion. You know, they are heading back home after everything that's been going on. They've been experiencing this heartburn of excitement as they're in the midst of, uh, well, the Passover week and all the festivities in Jerusalem. And their home's only seven miles from there, so Maybe they get to Jerusalem from time to time, but it's still a big festival in the holiest city that they have. And uh, they are disciples of Jesus. So they're not of the 12 disciples, but they're well-ranking enough that uh, at least Cleopas has a name. That's awesome. What about that name, Cleopas? It sounds a little weird to our ears, but it was a fairly uh, uncommon name even back then uh, because most of us know the feminine form more than the masculine. So yeah, uh, Cleopas, his name means glory of the father. And often that is the feminine form that we hear. The, the Greek uh, Cleopatra means the glory of the father. The, the daughter is the glory of the father. It's an odd name to have as a, a male. And uh, I just love that this is in there. On the other hand, the companion of this masculine name isn't named. We just get Cleopas. I always feel like when you name one person out of, out of two, you should name them both. It's, it's kind of rude to me to not have this in there. So often the Bible doesn't name people that I want named and names people that I, I don't really know as much about. Uh, I'll take that up at some other point, I suppose. But what else do we know about them? Well, uh, Cleopas and his companion, they share a house in a, a village seven miles out from Jerusalem, Emmaus. Sharing a house is an interesting thing. Uh, is it possible that they're a husband and wife? So often we get into this idea of the disciples being all male, we forget that there are female disciples too. And uh, they uh, were just as important, in fact, more important in some cases than the males because they uh, sheltered Jesus, they sheltered Paul. They were the ones that uh, seemed to be the ones funding the early church. So how rude is it to not have a name? I don't know for sure. I'm, I'm speculating here, but I, I think it's an interesting question. 
Also, the text in Greek, uh, our version today read um, the two of these disciples, but the Greek just says two of them. Two of whom? Two of them. We don't really know who the them is. We're just making the assumption that they were disciples. And that's a little frustrating too. That's what we got to walk and talk about, work out some of these finer points. The text then reads, suddenly Jesus himself came and began walking with them. Suddenly someone shows up and starts walking with the couple. I think that's a little weird if you're walking somewhere and suddenly someone's there, but they seem to accept it. They just go with it. And this uh, stranger <laughs> who asks them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? What are you discussing as you walk? It was obviously so much that they didn't notice someone coming up to join them. Who is this stranger? Were they so involved in the conversation that they didn't notice someone had joined them? That sounds pretty awesome to me. Who is this guy? Yet their hearts are burning within them, as we find out later, and they have to share what they experienced. They have to share the events of Holy Week. And you know, the story that they end up telling Jesus is very, very brief, very compact, but it's uh, pretty powerful and heart-wrenching when you get right down to it. First, they say, uh, Jesus was a prophet who did powerful miracles, a mighty teacher who was condemned to death by those who feared his power, he was crucified. And they said, we had hoped that he was the Messiah. Then they tell this stranger that they met on the way that uh, the women went to the tomb, found it empty, and an angel there telling them that Jesus was actually alive. Some of the men checked and yep, body is gone. So this is the story that they tell. This is the entire gospel that they have up to this point. It's so unfinished. It's so lacking the end, the resolution that we all want, the, the resurrection part of it. And it's so sad and heartbreaking, yet this is the story that they still feel compelled to tell, a story that's burning within their hearts, a story in the midst of this heartburn of grief that they're sharing with this total stranger on the way. So much of this story is contained in that one phrase, we had hoped. We had hoped. Now in English, this is you know, three words, a phrase, but in Greek, it's a single word with a major impact. In Greek, as in English though, this phrase rarely ends well. We had hoped, we had hoped to surprise you for your birthday, but clearly that's not gonna happen. We had hoped to repair the road before the storm blew through. We had hoped there would be sun outside as we were recording today. We had hoped that the pandemic would have ended by now. We had hoped rarely ends well. You know, there's a second kind of heartburn that they're experiencing at this point. We had talked about the heartburn of excitement now they're experiencing this heartburn of grief, disappointment that comes in this way. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge this grief, to recognize its existence, just like that half mile marker there. If we just set it beside a, behind us and we keep walking, we're never going to remember exactly those details. But if we take a moment and stay with it, sometimes we can learn a lot about what's going on. Now, it's a little bit like walking in pathways in the wilderness, which we're very much doing now. Rain seemed to be coming down, but we're going to keep walking and talking here because just like those disciples there, we don't have control over the weather. <laughs> you know, when walking on a path, your body adapts. On an unfamiliar wilderness path, you tend to be looking down, trying to find, are you doing, uh, putting your feet in a pile of mud? Are you putting your feet on a big rock that's in the way? But on the, the path home, you kind of run on autopilot. You don't really notice your surroundings as much. It's a chance to just talk and just let your body go through the path. But even a familiar path 
can feel unfamiliar when struggling with grief. You know, the, the uh, theologian Charles Schultz, um, best known for Peanuts, uh, has this amazing walk that he has his Peanuts characters do. The Charlie Brown walk, which is kind of like da-da-da, da-da. It's the trudging, and it's such a, a physical expression of grief, of sadness, of depression, of all these things. And look at, look at what it's doing. You're looking down at the ground as you're trudging along. It's exactly the position of an unfamiliar road, an unfamiliar wilderness. And when you are struggling with grief, even the most familiar path can feel like a surprising one, can feel like there's something that's going to jump out at you, get in the way, even when you've walked it a hundred times before. But I imagine that when Jesus appeared, these two disciples stood up, had an opportunity to straighten up and, and listen. After all, here they are st telling a story. And uh, if they were looking down while they were telling that story, wouldn't they have noticed the nail marks in Jesus' feet? It also tells us that Jesus probably isn't the most wildly uh, gesticulating character, or they would have noticed maybe the nail marks in his hands, too. Do you know, O oh Christian, you're a sermon in shoes? Do you know, O oh Christian, you're a sermon in shoes? Jesus calls upon you to spread the gospel news. So preach it and teach it, a sermon in shoes. You know, the disciples, Cleopas and the companion, they had to twist Jesus' arm to get him to stay with them. So yeah, even before the, these two knew who Jesus was, they, uh, they forced him to stay. They twisted his arm. In the Greek, this is only in the Bible twice uh, here, and one other time when Lydia forces um, Paul and Timothy to stay at her house. It's uh, got this meaning of like compelled to stay or almost forced. That's why I like this idea of twist their arm. You have to twist Jesus' arm to get him to stay. At the meal, uh, at the meal, Jesus reveals himself to them in the breaking of the bread. There's something special about eating with people that changes how things go. And then, of course, we recognize it as a reference to communion as well. So Jesus broke the bread. And they immediately recognized who he was, and then he disappeared. What would these disciples have felt when Jesus reveals himself and disappears? Their hearts have been burning within them then? I tend to think so. I think it's a difficult, difficult thing to do, uh, to, to imagine otherwise. And so here we have this third heartburn within the, the realm of this story, the, the third time that something happens. This is the, the heartburn of life, of new life, of resurrection. The heartburn of resurrection. And so what was a long trudge home becomes instead a swift journey. Uh, within the hour, we hear, they were headed back to Jerusalem. Jesus disappears. They've journeyed seven miles already. They just pack up some new things, turn right back around and head back to Jerusalem. And that walk back, that had to be an exuberant walk. Instead of being on the, the, the sense of uh, trudging along and asking what was happening, now they were asking, what is happening? It was a completely different sense, a completely different understanding. You experience this heartburn of life when you feel the joy of moving with great purpose. And so, when they're on their way, as our translation today says, that on the way is rose up. When they rose up to be on the journey. It's the same word in Greek for Jesus rising up from the dead. Anastasio. Jesus rising up. And it's the root of the word Anastasia. Uh, that, that name, if you're curious about it. It's one who rises up. Hmm. Imagine uh, Cleopas and the other disciple, they uh, ate their food had been broken, but then they were quickly 
getting back on their way back to Jerusalem to the other disciples to give them the news of what had happened. So let's do the same thing. Let's head back and talk about these experiences on the way. It's pretty dramatic. Do you know, O oh Christian, you're a sermon in shoes? Do you know, O oh Christian, you're a sermon in shoes? Jesus calls upon you to spread the gospel news. So know it and show it, a sermon in shoes. You know, this sense of heartburn a little bit about the way we worship together. It may be an odd way of putting it, but, you know, we experience the heartburn of grief in worship, and yet we support each other through the prayer of confession and passing the peace and these other ways we go forward. We examine the evidence, like Cleopas and the other disciple did, uh, of the, the Jesus story, and we do that uh, by reading scripture. And then we have the, the heartburn of excitement when we are just so pleased uh, to be doing these things. We have the proclamation like this, where we're telling the stories again, finding ourselves in them too. And you know, along the whole way, Jesus is there with us. Jesus is our companion, suddenly there, eating bread with us on the journey, being present with us in worship, even when we can't see Jesus, we know Jesus is there. Then when we sing, we show our exuberance, we show our connection to this heartburn of excitement also, in ways that spoken words just can't carry alone. When we break bread together, we reveal that Christ has been with us all along. And when we break bread together next week, we will find Christ's presence again. See, we move from hearing the word preached to being the word preached in our lives. Let's go back into our worship space here. May God bless you with a hopeful burning heart that you may feel Christ's presence with you as you walk the path set before you. May the Spirit fill your words and deeds with the power of God that all who know you know God. And may you worship God in good times and in bad, trusting that God loves you and grants you new life. Amen. <laughs>